Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We're really grateful that you're gonna give us some time of your Sunday evening. So this class is gonna be a maximum of an hour, 15 minutes. Uh, uh, um, by um, 8.20, we'll be out of your faces <laughs> by 8.20. Latest by 8.20, we'll be out of your faces. And um, we're hoping that it would be uh, a, a fantastic time. In fact, for some of us, this might be for some of us, one of the most impactful sessions that you've been in a long time. So this is the Strategy Factory introductory class now. So usually it's a part of a larger program called the Lead Simple Strategy Factory that holds every month. Uh, I used to hold at Charlton and then it went to Marriott. It's now, uh, now holds at the Eco Hotel and Suites. And um, um, so this module that we're given is actually the first module of 10 modules. So if you were to come to the strategy factory, you know, sometime towards the end of this month, this is the first module that you would also go through. We do this so that we can give out some value for free to, you know, people. And we also do it so that, so that some of us might make a decision uh, to be able to come to class uh, or not, you know, but whether you decide to come to class or not, trust me, this is going to be a massive class uh, for you. Uh, so please, if you can hear me, uh, just type yes. Uh, but also don't forget, I'm asking us to just you know, put in your name uh, and um, yeah, what you do so that I can look through it and try and make the class as, as relevant to every single person as I possibly can. Uh, so. Uh, uh, the organization that's bringing this to you is Lim Simple. Lim Simple means like investing money and business with Simple. Uh, we're Southwest and Nigeria partners with the Institute Management Specialist. We also run the uh, Lim Simple Business Academy, where the strategy factory is doing so. You know, and uh, we've had the opportunity to work with quite a number of organizations. Here's some of them. Uh, there are a few more, a lot more than you know than than this. Uh, but more important to this conversation, we've worked with well over, about well over 3,000 entrepreneurs now. I mean, that we've worked with through our indoor programs, but in terms of people that we've spoken to, maybe a couple of thousands, <laughs> you know, a uh, couple of hundreds of thousands of people that our, our work has impacted, you know, directly or indirectly. But we have, you know, been able to work with over 32 of these clients to exceed a billion a year. In fact, I had a meeting with, <laughs> with one of them this evening in BGC uh, just before coming back home to, to do this class, right? Great. And uh, also important to this conversation is that I'm also um, a member of the Forbes Coaches Council. The Forbes Coaches Council is sort of like uh, an elite group of you know, business and career coaches in the world. Um, I'm one of the first few people that got into that in Nigeria. The first four people that get into, got into that in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, and and it's, it's a huge honor, I would say, <laughs> you know, to be a, part of, be a part of that. So I always like to start every class with what do you really want with this conversation? You know, and, you know, I, I always ask you, because what happens to most of us is that we start our lives thinking about what we really want you know, but somewhere along the line, you know, because life starts to happen, we start to think about our lives based on what we think we can get. I'll give you a perfect example. So think about it. A young child, maybe 15, 16, 17, whatever it is, you're asking what kind of car you want to drive when you grow up. He says, I want to drive a Lamborghini, a Bugatti, a McLaren, something really, really cool, right? And so you give me great advice. You say, look, if you want to get this kind of car, you need to go to school, get a great job, you know, and just rule out all the whole nine years team. And the guy, you know, goes out there or, and somebody gives you that advice and then you go out there and you work hard and get all this good stuff. And then you're in your fourth job. Maybe now you earn about two million a month. And then you go and check how much the Bugatti is go online. It's about $3.2 million. And it doesn't ring a bell until you come back to Naya. <laughs> it's 1.5 freaking billion there. I'm saying you get a good idea. Like the purpose of a car is taking a point A to point B, and the Toyota will not be bad, <laughs> right? And so what happens to most of us is that we start to downgrade our dreams from what we really want to what we think we can get. And the reason why we do that oftentimes is because of our model for life. We think that life adds, whereas life compounds. Life 
compound. So I'll, I'll ask a question, right? Now, if I had these two things, and if I had these two things, on one hand, I had a Ghana must go with $5 million, right? And on the other hand, I have a magic coin. This magic coin has the ability to double itself every day for 30 days. After 30 days, it will stop, you know? So any coin that it doubles, it's a self-doubling coin and it will double itself every single day. After 30 days, the entire magic will stop. But on this other hand, $5 million. Which of them would you take? Yeah, let's see in the, in the comment section. I give you an opportunity, $5 million on one hand, a doubling coin that has the capacity to create you know, its own kind and it's double every day. Once a day, it's double once a day for 30 days. Which of them will you take? Who's gonna take the five million and just say, screw this nonsense, let's get the money and move on. Dollar is very expensive. Who's gonna take the money? Just type it, or you could say it if you want to. We have, you could, magic coin. Okay, Morenica Johnson says magic coin, you know? Why, why, would you, why, would, why would you pick the magic coin? How much would that magic coin be worth in 30 days? I know you guys know it's a trick question, but I want to know if you actually have an informed answer. How much would that magic coin be worth in 30 days? It will double itself. We need it's to know the value itself. of the coin. Only once a day for 30 days. What is the value of the coin? I, I'm not giving you all that information. I'm just saying I'm giving you two, two, two offers. You've been so good to me. On one hand, I say take five million dollars. You know, maybe I'm Tinubu. You know, and I have yes. billion value in my house. Five, so five million dollars on one hand. On the other hand, I give you a magic coin and says this magic coin is going to double itself. This magic coin is a penny. Oh, sorry, it's not just a coin. It's a penny. It's not even a dollar. It's a penny, like a one cover, right? So one cover. It's a penny. It's a magic penny. It'll double itself every single day, just once a day, for thirty days. <laughs> Which of them would you take? If you have the advantage of knowing the value of the magic coin, you it's not, a uh, different no, ball game. Both. Take one. Oh, I want magic coin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you know. You know you should take the magic coin. You just don't know what magic the value. Coin, so let me, if you take the if you take the five million dollars, you'd have the money. But if you take that magic pen, in 30 days, in 30 days, that magic penny would have become $10.7 million. And that's the, the reason why it's important to note this, is that life does not add life compounds. This is very, very important. So a lot of us are concerned about wanting what we truly want because we're not sure how it will happen. But if you just keep doing the right things and building your business and building your life, you would realize in a very short while that things would become better than you hope. So I'm gonna try and remind some of us of some of the things that we want, and then we then take, we'll get into the, see how we can help you achieve that. So some people want financial freedom. I mean, almost everybody here wants to be financially free, right? Some people want to make money and, and give to society. Some people want peace of mind. They don't want to have all the money in the world. They just want to have enough money to be able to do anything that they want and not have to worry about money again in their lives. Some want to have a lot of money because they want to build assets, you know, and assets is quite important. I mean, think about the house that you live in. If you don't own it, uh, somebody is making money off that house, from off you for, for that house, right? Person probably, you know, if the person were to sell that house to you or sell that house to anybody today, the person most likely would be selling it at a price perhaps higher than the price that they bought it whenever it is that they bought it. Right, some people want to make a lot of money because they want good health. Right, good health is you know, good health is, is fantastic, but good health is not cheap. Right, because for you to be healthy, you need to have you know, you need to have a lot of money, you need to be able to, you know, you need to be able to see good doctors, right? See great doctors, you know, and then you need to be. I, mean, I was driving one day and I was at the, I was in the car, and this, um, what do you call it? 
this um, fitness expert on radio is talking and is saying, you know, for you to be healthy, you need to keep your food intake between 1,800 to 2,200 calories a day. You know, and I immediately started laughing in the car because you need to have a lot of money for you to know what calories are. <laughs> how many of us know how many calories are in your food, that in the food you ate this afternoon? Right? No, none of us know it. Or most of us don't know it, right? Because ultimately, you eat until your pocket tells you to stop or your stomach tells you to stop, <laughs> right? To have calories, you need to have chefs. You know, most of us here, we have cooks in our house, not chefs. You know, there's cook, there's chef, then there's Alassi, there's Oloko, you know, all people, but you know, chefs are the ones that they went to school to study calorie counting, <laughs> right? Some people want to make a lot of money because they want good health or good quality education, rather, for their children, right? And ultimately, it's very powerful, not just because of the quality of education itself, which, by the way, it's great, also the quality of the people that would be in the class. Um, that you, you attended, right? And some people want to make a lot of money because they want to retire and start. So see this one? This is the one that I want to quickly explain because I usually get a lot of opportunity to work with organizations. And I'm talking to people who work, let's say banks and all that. I'm asking them, guys, what's your plan? I mean, at some point you're going to have to retire. And most people are like, ah, oh, don't worry, the pension fund is going to take care of that. And yeah, the pension fund is going to take care of that. But it's important to know what the pension fund is taking care of, right? So let's just follow me here for a minute. Imagine if you had a job that allowed you to put away 50,000 there to your retirement account. How many of us agree with me that that's a decent job? Right, if you agree with that, that's a decent job, right? Can you just say yes? You know, a job that allows you to save, contribute 50,000 there every single month to your pension fund, which is a pretty decent job. In fact, in the civil service, you have to have worked some years some considerable amount of years to get to the point where you can actually do that, right? How many of us agree with me? Anybody agree with me yet? Especially those of us that have worked in uh, civil service, you know, before. Great, thank you. Now, so that's about 600,000 a year, right? Now, if I had a way to do that, if I could do that for 20 years before I retired, right? And let's assume I found a way to get 10% guaranteed interest on that contribution. Now it's usually more like 4%, but let's say I could get 10% guaranteed interest per annum on that contribution. I can do that for 20 years, but more than that, I get something called compounding interest. About instant called it the magic, the eighth wonder of the world, compounding interest. Now, if I put all this together, at the end of my working life, or at the end of this 20 years, I would have about 32.2 million in my retirement account. How many of us would love to have this? Have this kind of money in your retirement accounts? If you, if, you, if, if, this is a, if, if you would love this, I want you to write amazing. I mean, because no, I mean, nobody in their freaking right mind would pass up an opportunity to be able to get this kind of money in their retirement account, true or false? How many of us would love that? Exactly. I mean, most people would love to have that kind of money in their retirement account. Now, but the small problem is that the small problem is this, is that no matter how much or little you think this is, right, uh, there's three sides to the story. Robert Kiyosaki said there's three sides to the story. There's the side that you're told, there's the side that, the that you believe, and then there's the truth. And unfortunately, the truth is not really as exciting because the problem is that in the future, in 20 years, you will get 20, 32.2 million, but the problem is what will 32.2 million be worth 20 years from now? And there's a way to actually find out. Because what's happening is that we're being sold today, but we're being sold tomorrow on today's excitement, right? It's exciting today to have this kind of money in your account. Question, how exciting would it be in 20 years? So let me show you. Now, to understand how exciting this has been 20 years, you need to think about the time value of money. Fantastic, thank you, Mr. Olimide, for saying that, right? So we need to go back to a year like, let's say, 1985. So in 1985, for example, if my dad had a brand new car, if my dad had, you know, uh, 3,000, say 3,500 naira, he could buy a brand new car. Of course, 3,500 naira was not back pocket change in 1985. It was a lot of money, in fact, it was some, uh, some civil servants annual side. So if he had 3,500, he either had a great job or had an amazing savings culture. So he was going to buy a brand new car. 
His friend says, no, 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 put that money in a savings scheme or in a retirement scheme. If you do that every single year, uh, you, could get, you could get a stupendous amount of money in the future. So my dad decides he'll save up this 3,500 every year and he'll put it aside into a retirement account. And this account promised him 10% guaranteed savings. He did this for 20 years and he got the same component, which is the same calculation that delivered our 32.2 million that to us. Now in 20 years, when he finally retired, he would have 224,600. Now this is by the same calculation that delivered this, right? Now this is a lot coming from 3005, but the problem is that he would get this money in 2005. Problem, question, 2005, 224,600, would he buy me a brand new car? No. Would he buy me a fairly used car? No. He probably would even buy me a useless car and stuff now. Why? Why? Because financial experts tell us that even though savings is a good habit, it's a very bad strategy because you're saving something faster. So you're saving something that is losing value faster than it is gaining numbers. You know, so if you want to really, 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 you know, create the life of your dreams, then you have to think about this. Don't save up money for an investment. Sorry, save up money for an investment. Don't save up money as an investment. Save your money and then buy a land or buy a business or do something with it. If the long-term strategy is saving money, you're going to lose it to inflation and all of that down the line, right? So having said that, let's go on into the module. Now, remember I said that this is the first module of the strategy factory. So Imagine that you're in strategy factory right now. This is the very first model that you're going to get here. And because it's a strategy factory, it's a business strategy workshop, the very first model we like to do is essentially about what a business is. So I'd like to ask, what is, at least to you, because everybody here, I mean, I've seen what we do. Most of us here in business, uh, there are manufacturers of paints here, there are real estate consultants here, there are industrial pest control people here. Uh, there's an author here, there's a, there's a therapist uh, here, the insurance brokers. So we all know what a business is. So I'd like to ask, what is a business to you? You can unmute yourself and say it, or you can just type it uh, if you, but by the way, there is no definition that you have that is wrong. If you've been in business for two weeks, you know exactly what a business is. So shoot, anybody? I'd like to take two responses or three responses without typed or spoken. And then we can then run into the definition that we have here. So anybody, what is a business to you? What is a business to you? Great. So let me... The business is what you do that gives you rewards. At least the business is some sort of a reward. If you there's no reward, then you, are not, you are not in business. That, there's something that, will, that will comes to you that makes you to go on. You are just not uh, doing, a, you are not doing something that is part of Christmas. You are in a business for a reward. Fantastic. So, business essentially is something you do that gives you reward. Um, so, MSB Hospitality, if you can help us with your name, says offering a service or product for cash or impact. Beautiful. Becky says it's a person's regular occupation or trade. Great. Anybody else wants to try? I want to give their suggestion rather. You could say it, you could type it, whichever one you want to do. Dennis, do you want to say something? Ta or ma? We don't know. Dennis, you want to say something? Yes, you engage on in order okay. to, it's an activities you engage on in order to earn reward at the end of the day. So Fantastic. Fantastic. Great. Thank you so much for all that response. I'm really, 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 really uh, I appreciate it a lot. So I want to show you a definition that I found in the book. I'll tell you the book that I found it from. And that definition has had the most impact on me. In fact, it's going to take us about 30 minutes to just try and unpack the definition so that you see exactly what it means. And if you measure your business by this definition, trust me, you would be, you become a massive business. And that Definition is this. Now, I got it from a guy called Josh Kaufman. He wrote a book called The Personal MBA. You should get that book if you haven't gotten it, if you haven't read it. Amazing book. Now, Josh Kaufman says a business is a repeatable process. Now, you have to note that because 
over the course of the, for those of us that are gonna to come to class, over the course of the strategy factory, we're gonna be discussing this concept of repeatable process, systems, structures, you know, development and the likes. But a business is a repeatable process that number one, deliver, creates and delivers something of value, creates and delivers something of value. Number two, that other people want or need. So number one, they cre it creates and delivers something of value. Number two, that other people want or need. Three, at a price they are willing to pay. Four, in a way that satisfies the customer's needs and expectations. And five, so that the business makes, brings in enough profit to make it worthwhile for the owners to continue operation. This is very, very critical. I love this definition. We're gonna spend the next 30 minutes trying to understand this definition. It says, a business is a repeatable process that number one, creates and delivers something of value. Two, that other people want or need. Three, at a price they're willing to pay. Four, in a way that satisfies the customer's needs and expectations. Number five, so that the business brings in enough profit to make it worthwhile for the owners to continue operation. So let's try and understand these five factors, right? So the first one says it creates and delivers something of value. So let's look at it. How valuable is what you're bringing to the market? You know, just when you're, when you're doing a business, you need to ask this product or service or whatever it is that I'm bringing to market, is it really valuable? And there are ways to ascertain the viability of your idea or your business, right? There are quite a number of ways, but I'm only gonna share four of them here today. Number one, this business that I'm doing, or this idea that I have, or this thing that I'm trying to do, number one, does it serve a huge expanding market? Is the market size huge expanding or is it shrinking? This is very, very important because some of us get into a business at this point and the market is already shrinking. For example, does it make any sense to own a cyber cafe now? No. Are there more people right now that have access to the internet than used to back in the day when cyber cafe were popular? Yes, but does it make any sense now? No, because that business model, that business you know, type is nearing its very end. It's very end. So what you want to find is that you want to get into a market that is huge and expanding, not one that is expired and closing. So for example, you'd see, for example, that, that you know, companies like say IBM that started out the PC revolution are out of the PC business today. Why? Because that market is shrinking. It's not expanding, right? If you notice, even most of the laptop creators are moving a lot of their focus to mobile. So the question now is whatever business that you're doing, right? The size of the market that you address, is it expanding or is it shrinking? You see, because if the size of the market is shrinking, you can grow a business that is larger than the industry that you play. Whatever it is that your business would make would always be a function or a fraction of what the industry is, uh, the industry has to offer, right? So you need to check with that, right? Am I, the business I'm in, is it in a huge expanding market? Number two, can it be turned into a unique product? Now, why is this important? Because if you really want to succeed, you need to move people away from wanting your product category to wanting you. See, because it's when somebody wants you in particular, then they are able or willing to want to pay something you know, pay something, maybe something extra or patronize you ahead of somebody else, right? So it's one of the reasons why you see that, uh, the, you see the difference between the woman who sells on your street and a proper grocery store like ShopRite or uh, Spa or any of those guys, is that you need to be able to shift yourself. And by the way, you don't have to be as big as ShopRite to create that uniqueness. Sometimes the uniqueness is just maybe in the approach that you are using to be able to get the, get the attention of the market. But it's very, very, very important that you figure out a way to be able to get the interest of people 
by, and sometimes it's not, you don't have to create a completely unique product. Sometimes the uniqueness of your business is not in the product itself, rather it's in the way you present the product. So let, let me give you an instance. Let me ask this question. Now, many of us here know like USSD code banking, right? Like star 737 and the likes. What bank do you think started USSD code banking? Anybody? What bank do you think started USSD GTB. code? GTB. GTB, great. Somebody says GTB. Anybody Zenit else? Zenit Bank. Zenit Bank, great. Anybody else? Zenit Bank. I heard Zenit Bank. I heard GTB. Anybody else with anything? Access. With any Access Bank, great. Anybody else? Anybody? Now, most people would sort of say GTB, right? Most people would say GTB. Now, if you say GTB, you would be wrong. <laughs> but, the, but what we want to explore is the reason why you said GTB, because that reason is very, very critical. And it's important for us to understand. Now, the first bank that actually started USD code, USSD code banking was actually First Bank. And your know, First Bank started it on the back of the success of um, of Paga. So Paga had figured out this business model uh, for, from a company called Impesa in Kenya. And they had figured out how to get the unbanked, you know, people that were not in the system to sort of get into, into the system. And they were quite successful. They'd gone into agency banking and all. And they were, they were quite successful and still are successful at it, right? And so in the big two ones to sort of join in on the party, First Bank came in and said, you know what, let's, and, and, and the thinking was, let's try and focus on you know, trying to get the market women, trying to get all these people to get into the bank. You know? But it didn't work out as well. Uh, next bank was actually you know, Stambik. Stambik you know, had a lot of their clients who were already in working class, people who had access to internet and the like. But when GT Bank started out, GT Bank asked the question that we always recommend our business owners to ask in Strategy Factory, when we get to the module of market entry and expansion, is who is our influence on market? Who should we be talking to? Sometimes you should not spend your energy talking to the client. You should be talking to the person that the client listens to. Very important. So GT Bank asked, who should we be talking to? And they concluded, and rightfully so, that they should be talking to young people between the ages of 18 and 25. And they asked, what's the best way to reach those people? Guess what the best way? Music. So that was how the 737 song you know, came about. Most of us can hear that song playing in your head right now. But this is what it meant. So what happened was that as people started, as young people caught in on that, and you know, your your uncle or your mother or whatever, you tell them to send you money, say, no, I will, I will send it to you next week when I get to the bank. No, 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 no. You don't need to go to the bank. You can do this. So the person who is educating his mom or educating his uncle has something to gain from that education. So he will do a great job educating you. And so more people had to open an uh, account, more parents had to open GTD accounts, more students open GTD account because uh, like their friend wanted to access money. It, it sounds like a small thing, but how many of us have noticed that at some point it became almost embarrassing not to have a GT account? GT Bank cashed out big hundreds of billions of naira and transaction from Star 737 alone. In fact, in the 2019 year end, GT Bank in that year, ending the year, was the most capitalized bank in Nigeria with a market cap of one trillion naira. One freaking trillion naira, <laughs> right? Imagine that. So sometimes uniqueness is not in, you know, trying to be completely different. It's just in finding an angle. Number three is this business I'm about to do, is it in its time? Remember, we, I drew this, right? So sometimes and in the beginning, I said some of us get into business at this point. And I said that you need to get into a business when it's huge, when the market size is huge and expanding. But sometimes some people get into business at this point here. Now, there's a small challenge with getting into business before it's time, because there's such a thing as time in business. Uh, and it's not wrong or right. It's just that you need to count the cost. Because oftentimes when you get into business at this point and it's not yet time, you are saddled with the responsibility to educate the market. And oftentimes, educating the market, education and industry is quite expensive. And so people run out of money, you know, at the point where the industry gets it. So for example, many of us might think about YouTube, and Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, what we might forget or 
might not remember is, you know, uh, uh, MySpace, High Five, you know, all of these, you know, um, social networking companies that sort of got us ready for <laughs> social networking, but ran out of money at the time when, you know, we sort of got the memo, right? So it's important for you to check and be sure that you're in an industry, or and if you are in an industry that is not yet, it's not yet time for, then you need to check if you can afford to educate the industry or maybe you should just wait. And lastly, does it give you leverage? What does that mean? It means that as my business grow, can I create a system that would enable, enable the business require less of my personal time so that my success does not become my demise, right? Very, 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 very important. Great. So that's just one. Point two is that this thing that I'm creating must be what, I, what other people want or need. So the question is, how needed are my offers? Am I creating something that people would need? You know, am I creating a need in the market? And I'm not, and I don't mean whether your product's expensive or cheap. I'm talking about have you created necessity in the minds of people? I'll give you an instance. One of the companies that has done that so well over the last you know, couple of years is Apple. How many of us here, and some of us here might be in that shoes, <laughs> how many of us here sort of feel like you know, Apple users, people who use iPhones or Apple products, they have the sense in which they feel like they made it in life. How many of us, how many of us have noticed that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So people say I, iPhone users are proud. <laughs> exactly. You know, are, you, are, you an, are you an iPhone user? No, no, I'm a Samsung user. <laughs> <laughs> now, so that, that feeling, as funny as it sounds, that feeling was engineered by Apple. And that feeling is the reason why Apple is the most, is the, big, is the largest company in the world by market cap, $3 trillion. So what they have done is that they engineered the feeling of, and by the way, they did a research and found out that um, Apple users use Apple because they love Apple. And in the same research found out that Samsung users use Samsung, not because they love Samsung, but because they hate Apple, <laughs> all right? And, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting research. And so they found out that Apple has this factor, you know, two people walking, complete strangers see themselves using a particular iPhone and all of a sudden they, they, they could become friends just using, just knowing that they use the same phone, right? Very important. Now, and it's the reason why many might not realize, but it's the reason why Apple sort of has, so the problem with the difference between Apple and Samsung is that you could see two people using Samsung produced in the same year and they still don't feel like equals because one of them is using the Samsung A whatever and the other one is using the Samsung S whatever, produced in the same 2022, but you know because the, the market segmentation, which is great, is also sort of like their own doing. If you see two people using an iPhone in any two year period, they immediately feel like equals. So it enables people to connect better and it enables to feel like, you know, so the question is, do people you people who use your products, right? Do they feel as though your products add something to how they feel about themselves? Because if you get your products to that point, guess what happens? They're going to use your product as gold standard. They talk about it, they would attach their self-esteem to it, you know, and it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's using your pest control service, they'll tell their friends, look, if you haven't used these guys, I'm sure there's a rat in your house. Whether it's, you know, selling real estate, they're gonna tell them, look, if this guy isn't buying, if this guy isn't selling you real estate, forget it, you know, or if Bolaji is not supplying you something from his, from his, from his farm, forget it, you know? I'm telling you, you know, if, you know, if Olumide is not the one selling your insurance, you're probably being scammed. The point here is that you need to create that need in the minds of people for your service. Three, at a price they are willing to pay. And here it's not so much about whether your product is expensive or cheap. It's really about focusing on being able to find the right, the right person that you should be talking to. Every business has ideal customers. And 
Abraham Maslow, as a psychologist, has explained that different people exist at different parts in society, and it sort of informs how they buy. So let me if I if I'm hungry, for example, and I need to buy food, if I had 300, I'm probably somebody down here, I'll buy buy food. I'll go to one mama and I'll eat a decent meal. If I had up to 750 to 1,000, I could go to Chicken Republic, I'll have a decent meal. Maybe a reform meal, whatever, but I have a meal. If I had a bit more money, let's say five to 10,000, I could go to maybe like Caspar and Gambini, or I could go to Rhapsodies, I could have a decent meal. If I had a bit more money, maybe 50, 60K, I could go to Marriott or a hotel and have a decent meal. If I had a little bit more money, 300 to 500,000, I could go to Cali and have a decent meal also. The same one meal difference. So the person who organizes, who, who owns the restaurant here, Kali in VI, where you know, a plate of meal would be as high as 350,000, is not looking for this person who's trying to sell mama put. And so what we find is that in business, so many businesses that we have seen is structured in a certain way. And the business structure is not designed for the customer that the employee, that the, that the entrepreneur is hoping would come. So you need to design your business for the right customer, right? I'll tell you a funny story. So I had this opportunity to speak somewhere in 2019. I spoke alongside the MD of an online investment, right? And so, you know, he guy took a liking to me, invited me to, uh, to lunch at his house. And uh, how many of us here have been to the house of somebody that has made it in life? Not someone that is trying to make it, someone that has made it, certified made it in life. You know, you enter the house, you know, you know, this house and heaven are not very far apart. How many of us have been to that kind of house? Ah, none of us. I, I know. Just, just, I mean, you have to. So I go to this man's house. Beautiful house. Trust me. Amazing house. So I get to the house and the man invites me on. We talk. They invite me to lunch. And this man's wife, who's a chef, by the way, puts a six-course meal in front of us. You know that part where the Bible says, you know, prepare a table before you, friends of the enemy, well, there were no enemies there, but food was. I mean, I, I, mean, I was familiar with three course meals, but six course meals was something else, right? So I'm sitting down, I'm about to start eating. And what I didn't know was that the man had a neighbor who both of them sort of traveled to different parts of the world and sort of like eat, you know? That's how you know you made it in life, when you could just say, hey, let's go to Japan or let's go to you know New York and just experience a restaurant or something. So the man's friend comes in and says, oh, you know, you didn't write me, blah, 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 come in, come in, so the boat, get her there, and they're going to eat. And I'm there, and then, of course, the conversation becomes about food. And so this man's friend had a very unique way that he talked about food. He would say something like, um, if you eat in this restaurant, you will know that God is truly God, you know, or if you taste these people's strength, you know that Jesus Christ came from earth. You know, that kind of thing. very funny ways to talk about food. And so we started talking about different places that we're eating. And you know, some of them had not been, some of them I've never heard about. Uh, but some of them have been there, you know. So I'll talk about it and he'll talk about it. And then he mentioned the restaurants in Dubai, uh, GW Marriott. And fortunately, I've been to that place in 2017. Uh, I had it in one of my mentors there. And then he mentioned uh, a restaurant in France. And incidentally, two weeks to that day, I was in France and I, you know, had. A great time that place also. I mean, so it was, it was so he was like, ah, this guy, you should talk about this. I said, I'm not doing anything, you know, but don't come and yeah, you're not in the same category. And I said, that he's going to ask me one question. If I've eaten this thing, I know that. Me and I said, I said, sir, we're not in the same category. He said, have I eaten blue tuna before? I said, what's blue tuna? He said, I should Google it. Blue tuna, men and brother, please Google it. Blue tuna is a fish. The fish is $3.2 million. Yes, you heard me right. Edja fish that they used to eat, like kote and catfish, is 3.2 freaking. In fact, if you were um, attentive just a little bit after the pandemic, I think late 2020 or early 2021, some guy in Worry caught a tuna fish, and he and his friends that would never make it in life used oil to fry the fish and ate it. The fish was worth $3.6 million they didn't even know. You know? So here's the thing. <laughs> tuna fish. He said, you know, you go, you go to Japan to eat that fish, uh, they'll cut you small, small slices, like small, small cubes like this for like a thousand dollars. You eat like four cubes and you know that God is God. I said, look, sir, my sense of uh, amount of money I do have is not going to allow me to eat that kind of fish now, <laughs> right? But the point here is that the blue tuna guys probably here 
is not looking for this kind of person here. So is your business structured for the type of people that you're hoping your business will attract? And I'm not saying this because I want you to only focus on luxury clients. No, luxury clients doesn't mean that you're successful. And small clients doesn't mean that you're not successful. Some of the biggest businesses in the world target the bottom of the pyramid. Some of the biggest businesses in the world also target the top level people. So it's a function of matching your strategy, your customer acquisition strategy with the client that you're trying to look for. Four, in a way that satisfies the customer's needs and expectations. And here we're talking about how satisfied you leave your customer. Now, this is the quick test that I usually ask. If you look at your business and in your business, in terms of the way you attract clients, you don't have, every time you sell to somebody, that's sort of like the first time that you're meeting them, you know, so you don't have repeat sales or you don't have referred sales, then there's something that you're not doing right with your customer retention strategy. Because sometimes to increase your business is not in finding new clients. It's taking care of the ones that you currently have. So you need to look at, and we're going to talk extensively about that in class, that how do you, how do you create a strategy that takes care of the customer, where the customer is a human being, not just a number on your database and a number on your phone book that you just call, but an actual human being, you know, that could actually do business with you, right? And then lastly, so that the business brings in enough profit to make it worthwhile for the owners to come. Because if, if the business isn't profitable, guess what? It'll be stressful, you won't continue. So how profitable is your business? Now, this is very, very important. In fact, I went to a seminar by um, Brian Tracy a couple of years ago. I don't remember most of what he said, but I don't forget this. He said this and I, and, and I took it home. In fact, not only did I take it home, I took a picture of it, I posted it somewhere in my house, in my office rather, where I could always see it all the time. He says, profits are the cost of the future. And why is that important? Because the future of your business costs profits. Why is that? Why, what, how does that make sense? Because wealth is measured in time, not numbers. So it's not so much how much money your business has or how much money you have. It's how long you can get you. So if you have 100 million now in your business today and your burn rate, meaning like you know, your, run, your runway rate, the amount of money that you have to spend every month is 10 million. If there's no inflow, and when I say inflow, I'm not just talking about like money coming in. I mean, money margin, like the difference between what you're having to spend and you know, uh, what, you, what it costs to produce that value and the value itself. If there's no inflow coming into the business, in 10 months, you'll be in trouble because you burn, every, you burn 10 million every month. In 10 months, you'll burn off 100 million and now you need to raise money somehow, right? So the question is, if your business isn't making a lot of money, guess what happens? you're going to get to a point where you're going to get into trouble, right? So I want to show you something. I want to do a quick test with us. Uh, it's going to take about 10 minutes. And after that, we're going to round this up. And that test is going to be, it's going to be a little weird at the beginning, but it's going to change the perspective and change your desire for profitability, right? Now, but usually, most of the time, most people don't really follow through on this test with me. It's just 10 minutes, but it could be the most, the, the most important next 10 minutes of our lives for some of us. So if you're interested in following me through on this test, I need you to get a notepad. A notepad or a paper and a pen, something that you can write with, uh, because I'm going to be talking you through writing a couple of things. And I want you to get those things ready. And then I want you to write ready in the chat room. Ready, ready in the chat room, All right? Get the things ready, and I want you to write ready in the chat room. If I see five people write ready, I know that we're good to go. And then we'll move on to the, to the activity. Good. Thank you, Bolaji, for indicating. Simon, thank, Samson, sorry, thank you. Harrison, thank you. Harrison Ayo. James, Joseph, Laurie, Hospital. Idris, oh, beautiful. This is a great class. Alice, Akwa, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So great. So the next slide, I'm going to run through this next slide now, right? And don't, don't write what you see on the slide. I would explain every single factor there. So I want to find out how much money you spend every month. Why? Because I want to see the burden that you have 
uh, hospitality, sorry. I want to say the burden that you are on your business and I want to see if your business can carry you as a body, talk less of carrying the rest of your staff. So the first thing I want us to write is rent. Most of us here pay rent. Now, if I've mentioned something that you don't spend money on, please don't bother writing it, just, you know, just write zero. Uh, so most of us here pay rent. Now in Nigeria, for those of us that live in the country, your rent is annual, right? Right? So I want you to take that annual, divide it by 12, and I want you to write what the number is what the monthly number is, right? So and when you do that, I want you to write rent done in the comment section. So if I see rent done, I know that you've done rent, right? So if I see five people say rent done, I know that we've done rent. Okay. So take your annual. If you live in your own house, zero, just write rent done and let's go. And here I'm talking about your office. Your house, not your office, it's just your personal experience, experience access to with you. James, thank you very much. Next person, don't write the amount, just write rent done. It's whatever it is, it's personal to you. We don't want to see it, but we want you to. Uh, Lori Hospitality, you wrote zero, so I'm trying to understand what that means. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Morenike Johnson wrote done. Do you mean rent done? Okay, okay, great. Laurie, hospitality, thank you. Fantastic. So the next thing is this. Most of us here spend money on transportation, right? Most of us sort of have your, you have your own car. If you have your own car, for example, you probably fuel it weekly, for example, maybe 10, 20, 30,000 weekly. I don't know what kind of car you drive. If you don't have a car, you probably take a bus. Maybe there's like a thousand naira budget every day or 500 naira budget every day, or you take Ubers and the likes. So I want you to sort of estimate how much your transportation bill, um, cost is. And I want you to write TP done. So if it's 10,000 naira, you fuel every week, that's 40K in the month, right? If you take the buses every day and you spend 1K, uh, every day that would be about 30k in a month because 30 days in a month if you do ubers you know you could just estimate it and sort of figure it out when you're done with that i want you to write t p done t p done thank you i they won't care thank you ayuba james james joseph or chahi thank you so much anybody else i'm waiting for three more people uh mudashiro thank you i can't write down because i'm in transit uh, follow closely, and you can just type it out in your type it out in your in your notepad. Get your notepad in your phone. It's important that you do it. It's really going to be life transforming for you, by the way. Okay, great. Quite a number of us. Beautiful. That's nice. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next thing is utilities now, right? So utilities are a bit tricky, right? Most of us are so under utilities. Most of us here pay light bill depending on where you live, IKDC, EKDC, whatever it is. So write whatever that is. Most of us here live in gated environments. Uh, you live in gated environments. So you have maybe estate dues or security bills, right? Most of us here have some form of cable bill, DSTV, Go TV, High TV, Low TV, whatever TV you, you, you subscribe to, right? Most of us here have fuel for our generators. Uh, the generator that we that we use as an alternative to NEPA, or the generator that is the main one who NEPA is an alternative to, <laughs> depending on where you live, right? So when you finish all of this, I want you to write UT done. So that tells me you're done with utilities. Uh, any other thing you consider utility, you can add it. You know, great. Kichigo, thanks for uh, Idris is done with UT. Utilities, great. Who else? I do not care. Thank you so much. Who else? This is an amazing, amazing group of people. Morena Care, Modesta, Lisa. Uh, who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Uh, Ikechibu, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Who else? James Joseph is done. Uh, Odi Mayo, Babatunde. Harrison Ayo is done. Oh, great. Thank you. So next thing is uh, feeding cost. So feeding cost, right, is not food stuff in your household. Feeding cost, this feeding cost only sort of apply to people that don't work from home. So you work somewhere and you live somewhere else. And there's a small place, a small budget where you just want mama food somewhere that you used to buy your lunch every day. And there are 25 working days in a month. Sometimes it's like 1K, 
you know, sometimes it's like 500, whatever it is. Sometimes it's like 2 million if you're a blue tuna person <laughs> every day. But the point is I want to find out where all your money is going to. So that small feeding budget, I want you to, you know, multiply by 25 working days and I want you to write FD done. FD done tells me that you're done with the food feeding cost. We'll get to food stuff in your house, but just do feeding uh, FD, FD done. Good, Idris, thank you. Thank you so much, Idris. Thank you, Mr. Olumide. Thank you, Moreni Kerr. Thank you, Babatunde. Thank you, Joe, James Joseph. Thank you. Thanks, I mean, you guys, this is, this is, this is uh, Harrison, thank you. Uh, FD done, yeah. This is, this is, this is an amazing, an amazing group of people. So next is groceries. So groceries is food stuff, right? It's the whole nine years. If you're married with kids, it's usually a very big budget. It's food stuff, it's um, toiletries. You know, it's, a, it's really a big budget. So when you figure out what that is, I want you to write GC done. GC done. So groceries is food stuff, toiletries, first aid boxes, provisions. Um, I mean, just think about the whole nine yards, every single thing. So if you are not married and you know, you're just there chilling, it has not reached your level. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so write GC done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian Kettenson. Grateful. Thank you, Anna. Great. I mean, I mean, if you guys are still on, most people would have given up as of now, you know. How about Sunday? Great, 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 great. Great, 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 great. Fantastic group of people. So next is school fees. So school fees, now if your children are not yet in the university, so that means you pay school fees three times a year, right? So that means there's like term one, and then there's term two, and then there's term three, right? Now, if you add all these terms together, it'll give you, and then divide that by 12. So that would, you know, this would give you like the total divided by 12, and that will give you what it's due monthly for each child, right? And so you can, I mean, you at least you know what happened last year. You might not be able to predict what's happening next year. We're just talking about what you spent. So what happened last year, Tim one, Tim two. Three. And then you do that for all the kids, right? There's no buy one, get one free school. And so when you do that, that tells you how much the school fees is on, on, on each child. So when you're done with that, I want you to write SF done. So that tells me, that you're done. If you don't have children yet, that's nice. That's completely out. Uh, if you don't have kids and you're paying for like school fees, so you're, you're paying for masters or something, you can also write that down. Or if you're paying for courses, you, know, you can also write that down. If you are, I mean, so very, very important. But if you have children and you're paying for that, please note that and write SF done. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you so much, uh, DME John, John Gilbert. Thank you, Lumi Day. Thank you, I don't care. Thank you, uh, Alice. Thank you. Great, 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 great. You know, it's important. It's important to write these things down. We want to see where all the money is going to. It's very, very important. Harrison, thank you so much. Great. Next is um, personal expense. Personal expense is how much you spend on yourself. It's not a lot for most people, except if you belong to like the Ashwabi gang, right? You know, Ashwabi gang every, you know, Ashwabi every day. You know, that's so, but personal expense, you know, so write PE done. If you're just personal upkeep, it's not a lot of money for most people. Except if you go to Ashebi every week, every weekend, you know, there's always like a wedding or something that you go to every weekend. Well, if it's on that one, you're on your own. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Dairo, Olaji Day Dairo. Ikechiku, thank you for. Mr. Olamide, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, next is. Child care expense. So child care expense is like how much you spend on your child that is not school fees, right? Child care expense. So, so, so example, 
Uh, some of us here have children that are not in school yet, and then you have nannies, and then you have you know all of that. Some of us here do pocket money for those children, you know, whatever it is, CC done, right? CC done for childcare expense. Childcare expense. Great, thank you, I did okay. CC done, thank you, Mr. Olumide. We're almost there. Great, so next is communication. Communication is airtime and data. How much do you spend on airtime and data? So you write C-O-M-S, done. Communication is airtime and data, C-O-M-S. How much you spend on airtime and spend on data on a weekly basis? On a monthly basis, sorry. How much you spend on airtime and spend on data on a monthly basis? Airtime and data comes. Yes, comes. I didn't care. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Olumide. Thank you, Ikechiku. Thank you. You guys are doing amazing. Wow. Great. Next is giving. So giving is... So, so many of us give, you give to your parents, you give to God, you give to, you know, it's sort of like difficult to do, but you sort of can estimate if you think about it pretty well, you know? So just think about, you know, who I mean, my, what's my average giving budget in a month? And then I want you to write giving done when you figure that out. So giving, thank you, Lori. Lori, with, with the kind of picture you have, you have on your DP, I wish I'm one of the people that you give to, because you look like somebody that gives a lot. <laughs> oh, great. The next is um, other expenses. So other expenses is anything I've not covered, you know, so maybe, like, you know, anything that I haven't covered, you know, you have a driver, you have a butler, you have whatever it is that you have. When you finish for other expenses, other expenses, I want you to write all done, all done. So that's the last one, all done. Anything that I haven't covered that you think is important, uh, just cover it and then write all done. So I'm having to mute us because I'm trying to keep it clean. I'm trying to keep it clean for the recorded to for the recording sorry thank you so if you've done all i want you to add everything up together because that tells you how much money you spend in a month when you get all that together i have two questions to ask you two questions to ask you and then we'll call it an evening Add it all up. And when, you, when you're done adding it all up, don't write what it says because it's personal to you, but I want you to write down how shocked you are as to how much money you spend every single month. Many of us might not have known this, but just, you know, just write all done, calculate it. I'll give you a minute to do so. It shouldn't take long. And then write how shocked you are. So let's see, we're waiting for you. Those of us that have finished adding it all up. So add it all up. I don't care what's I'm guessing that that's uh, 
Is that a good hmm or a bad hmm? This is huge. Exactly. Many of us might not know it because we're not, it's not present in our minds. So the first question I want to ask you is, right now, can your business afford to pay you that amount of money or salary? Or sorry, does your business pay you that amount of money or salary? Just write yes or no. Or write how short you are. Can your business afford to pay that amount of money? Not absolutely. Great. So if your business is your primary source of income and it cannot afford to pay you this amount of money, the next time you're in church and you're praying against a Rupama woman, Kama and uh, Kankawa, don't pray. <laughs> don't pray because you are in collaboration with the Pama woman, the Kankawa that is collaborating to Pama wise. <laughs> Don't pray. say, God, you ask for mercy. Uh, uh, you collect uh, these tablets. Uh, God, God, I beg you. <laughs> God, I beg you. You know. So, for most of us, you know this, this, this question. The, the, but the second question is the most important question. In fact, for those of us that are interested in coming to the strategy factory, the second question is really about this. It's really about this. How big does your business need to get to be able to pay 20 people in your organization such a monthly salary? See that monthly, salary, that monthly expense that you wrote? I want you to think about it. How big does your business need to get to be able to pay 20 people, 20 people that work for you? Some of us don't even have 20 people that work for us, but if you have 20 people that work for you, how big does your business need to get to be able to pay them that amount of money and salary? You see, because if you have a business here and you have like one person working for you, the reality is that the very least they want from their lives is what they see you have. And so you have to design a business and grow a business that is big enough to accommodate their dreams. Because the problem with a lot of us as entrepreneurs here is that we are only building a business for ourselves. We're not building a business we're not building a business that represents the dream of the people that work for us. And it's very, very, very important that you do so. Why? Because if you don't, and the people are working for you, they would leave at some point to go create, to go create their own lives. Right? Oh, okay. Dairo said she, he lost me for a minute. I said, how big does your business need to get to be able to pay 20 people that work for you, 20 people that work for you, the amount of money you just wrote down as your monthly expense. Because if you have a business, guess what's happening? They see you, they want what you have. They want what you have. And so you have to work towards creating the kind of life, creating the kind of business that can represent their dreams, right? The kind of business that they would love to be a part of. You know, this whole nonsense that we tell people sometimes, that you can't be a billionaire working for somebody else. It's true. It's wrong. It's crazily wrong. There are billionaires in this world that have never started a business in their lives. But guess what? They're working in the right places. The question is, if somebody in your organization decides this small, this small question, I asked the client and it moved them from doing less than about three billion to over almost 20 billion. Oh, the volume is low. The volume Sorry. is low. Can you hear me? Can, I, can everybody hear me well? Thank you very much for saying that, sir. How many of us can hear me well? If you can hear me well, I want you to write well or write yes so that I know. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So like I said, it's very, very, very important that you focus on building a business that can embody the dreams and the, and the aspirations of your people so that you can have the right people that can work with you. Now, if that's what you want and you're interested in building such a business, no matter how small or big your business is, I'd love to work with you in our next Strategy Factory workshop um, that is coming up on the 26th of August, I believe. Yes, at the Eco Hotel and Suites. Now, in that class, we're going to tackle all of these topics. I'm sending in the slides so you can review all of this. And 
there are over 35 different topics that will be trashed over a 10 to 12 hour period. And it's gonna be trashed in a class of about 30 people, 30 participants uh, in, in, in the class. And it's usually an amazing experience, right? It's not just a great experience, it's also a fun experience. And trust me, it's gonna be one amazing experience for yourself. Now, for those of us that want to make it to the class, the strategy factory is 120,000 there. We hold it at the so we hold that a hotel. A hotel is the best venue to hold an event in the country. And we do that because I believe that where you learn is more important than what you learn. And I'll tell you why. Because let me give you an instance. In the last class, just this last class, I mean the August class that held, we had about six of the 24 people that were in class. Six of them were already doing business in excess of 500 million to a billion a year, right? You know, and sometimes you're sitting down with those people. The person, you know, the, the strategy factory is not just about the learning, it's about the connections. You know, two months ago, we connected two people together. And then they did a transaction of 146 million. We've connected people together, done transactions of 560 million. I'm talking about alumni members together. So it's not just only about the people, sorry, the, the it's not only about the what you learn and the like, it's also about the people that you meet, the opportunity to be able to expand your business, the opportunity, of course, to be able to learn a whole lot. This time around, where we already have some organizations sending in people. Um, one top real estate firm is sending in five people, another one, another company is sending in six people. Uh, we it's a, it's it's and and these companies we're talking about uh, the 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 MGs of the companies are coming themselves. And we're talking about companies that do X of five, six, seven billion a year, uh, a year in revenue, right? Stupendous amount. So you want to come for those of us that are on this call, the twenty eight of us. You're going to get the opportunity to pay a hundred thousand and not one twenty. So we're going to discount twenty thousand and from you if you pay within the next four to five days, right? And for those of us that will be coming to class, of course, it's going to be you know it's every it's all, it's all inclusive tea break lunch drinks the whole nine yards. You're going to get access to the strategy factory. Uh, uh, the, the class that you attend, you're going to get access to its online class. Uh, you're going to get access to the community where you know you could you know connect and then and also sort of become a part of that and then also do business with people within the community uh, everybody's going to get a post training strategy session with me one-on-one -on -one session with me personally you know if you want it in person or you want it virtually whichever one is fine and then you also get an additional zoom session a week after the strategy factory on selling right uh, and if you can't make it to Lagos for the same amount, you get you, you can attend live. We've had people, we've had people who flew in from Ghana, Liberia, from Abuja, from Boeing, from to the class. But we've also had people who you know zoomed in <laughs> from Dubai and the likes of the class. So you can get out there. You still get everything else, but you then get two strategist um, session with me instead of one. The person who comes to the live class gets one, but because you are getting the access on Zoom. Uh, so if you're ready, you could pay to discount or you could contact Vivian. Okay, by the way, if you're, if you're interested in this class, do us a favor. Um, I, I want to talk to some of those that are interested in this class. So you can do us a favor again and just write your name and your number. Just post it in the chat room now, you know, so you could write something like this, you know, and your number, for example and just post it like this, right? So if you write that, you know, it tells me that you are one of those that are really interested in, you know, joining the class uh, and want to take advantage of this of this uh, discount. Uh, somebody from my team will talk with you tomorrow and I, I can also commit that I will talk to you tomorrow. If you're gonna to commit tomorrow, I will personally talk to you tomorrow. I will figure out uh, how best your business is. And it's important that we have this conversation so that uh, we can also start to look at how uh, sometimes when we have this conversation, I'm able to realize that, oh, I need to connect you to somebody, you know, that will probably be coming to class or someone that's been to class before, because more than the class, we're also going to make the connections that's going to help you uh, expand your business, right? Sorry, my kids, it's bedtime for my children, so I need to run. <laughs> I need to run. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, thank you so much, Harrison, Ayo. Thank you, Ikechiku. Uh, for for writing down your details. 
uh, you get a you get a message from Vivian tonight. Uh, you get a call from me tomorrow. Uh, everybody who's written down their numbers will get a call from me tomorrow. Uh, and if you're watching the replay, uh, my number, uh, you could essentially just, you know, chat Vivian up and then she could get, connect us together. And I'd like to talk with you. Thank you so much for those of us that have responded to this. Thank you so much, Priscilla. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Like I said, it's, yeah, it's a hybrid event. So you could be there physically. In fact, for those people who cannot make it, here's what we do. We provide access to it virtually. You can attend it virtually. You get access to all the, to all the, to the, 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 PM, the one on one session with me and the likes. And then you also, on a future date, for example, you can also then attend at no extra cost. So we've seen people who, you know, are not in the country at the time and then they attend the class. And, and, um, then what happens is that they attend it virtually and then they come back and then they're available at this time and they say, you know what, I'd like to attend it in person, you know, um, and they give us like a two days notice, we get them in the class, you know, so it's, it's really, really cool. It's really, really cool. Trust me, but it's also an amazing, an amazing experience. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Uh, this is Vivian's number for those of us that want to get through to her. Save this number. This number is going to be chatting you tonight for those of us that have sent in our numbers. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of us that have responded. Thank you so much. Uh, for the rest of us that are still considering, uh, uh, the offer will still be around to you tomorrow. You could, you could send in uh, your numbers, but I'd like to get your number now so that I know how many people I'm gonna to call tomorrow. I will call you tomorrow between uh, sort of 12 noon and 2 p.m. Each of us will get a call from me so that we can you know, quickly commit to the class ASAP. And uh, so do the Dream Youth Development Initiative. Can you help us with your name, sir? Uh, do the Dream Youth Initiative. Help us with your name. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, so any question, if you have any question, you could ask me and then we could take it up from there. But thank you so much. I'm, I'm three minutes above my time, uh, but I, I wanna thank us all. I mean, this, this has been an amazing, an amazing opportunity, an amazing session for me to have learned and I've enjoyed, sorry, enjoyed myself throughout this process. Okay, great. Mr. Olutayo is do the dream. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. This session is recorded. I will send the recorded version shortly uh, before the end of today, by the way, into the group and uh, you'll be able to access it after now. Thank you. Thank you. I do not care. Thank you so much. Any, anybody with a question for me? Anybody with a question for me? Thank you, interesting session. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I'd love, I'd love you to also send in your feedback in the group about the session, uh, so that we can stir up interest with those that missed it out, so that they can, of course, uh, wait for the the recorded version. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic evening. Uh, for those of us that wrote our names and our numbers, you'll be you'll be sent a message tonight by Vivian. And you would also be called tomorrow by Vivian and myself so that we can get you straight into class and we'll be ready to kick off on the 26th of August in Echo Hotel at the Lavender Hall, right opposite the convention center in Echo Hotel. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic evening. Bye-bye, everyone.